Father, thank you for the opportunity to meet freely and unafraid to give testimony to your great name. Lord, we do that again uh, as we just come in a heart of submission to your word, to your truth. Lord, would you do in our lives as your people what only you can do by your Holy Spirit and what only you can do by your truth? And would you just uh, cause us to see uh, the grace of God and the wonder of your love and the work of Christ and the glorious gospel in ways that we haven't before? And allow us as the people of God to rise up and praise your name, to love each other, to love you, and do all of this for your glory, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, it was back in the early 90s that uh, a guy named Ron Enroth wrote a book entitled Churches That Abuse. I think the title kind of tells you where that's going, doesn't it? Churches That Abuse. He followed it up actually with a second book called Recovering from Churches That Abuse. It's a, it's a startling and sad commentary as you read either of those books about manipulation, about intimidation, about guilt, about legalism, about every manner of uh, authoritative abuse that one could think of, all done in the name of Christ and sadly all done within the context of a local church. Some of the things that appeared in this uh, book, in these two books, about what churches have done to people, uh, uh, things that we're familiar with, uh, if we've had any experience in churches or, or have spoken to others, uh, dress code obviously is always a, a big issue for some places, uh, hair code, just general appearance things that you're supposed to follow or, or do or not do, dietary rules. Uh, one church encouraged people to report sins of other members to the pastor. Uh, one church said you couldn't wear contact lenses or prescription glasses, which means I wouldn't ever know if you were here or not on any given Sunday or if anybody was here for that matter. So uh, you might like that rule. Uh, no seat belts because we, after all, we live by faith. Maybe some of you uh, operate on that principle. Uh, no sex even for married couples. No uh, contact with attorneys. There's, there's a lot of reasons why that might make the list. We don't have time to go into all of those, but probably the most important one is so that you don't turn around and sue the church for any of these things that they're perpetrating on you. I, I suppose in some of these cases, if you went to some of these churches, it, it might have the appearance of sincerity. It might have the appearance of these are, these are committed people. They, they, they want to do the right things. I suppose, in some cases. I'm not sure in every case. But even if that were the case, how terribly wrong could they be in laying those things upon their people? I, what, one antidote, one story that, uh, not terribly pertinent, but just was very funny to me, uh, was, was a church that had a softball team. Took me back to the early days uh, in the 90s uh, when Covenant dominated softball in uh, Oklahoma City. And... Uh, so in this one particular instance, the, the uh, pastor uh, kind of coached from the bleachers. They had a coach, but the pastor kind of called the shots during the game. And in one inning, he, he told the coach to sub like five or six guys out at once. And, and the coach did it, except he left in the associate pastor uh, for reasons unknown and this just rankled this pastor to no end, and he spent the rest of the game yelling out abusive things uh, to the coach from the bleachers. Well, that wasn't the end of it, because the next game, by way of uh, imposing his will upon the team, he said, everybody has to play a position that they don't normally play, and everybody has to bat from the opposite side that they normally bat, because he sensed there was with, within the team a spirit of pride and he wanted to humble them and embarrass them, and no doubt he did that. You know what? It's hard sometimes to even know how to respond to stories like that, to things like that. But this, I, I do know this. The farther we move away from the grace of God, the more we embrace man-made rules and regulations, the more likely the outcome is not going to be a good one. 
So we come to Colossians 2 again this morning. We're coming to the last part of chapter 2. In many ways, it's, it's the second part of what we did last Sunday. So if you're with us last Sunday, uh, it'll, it'll be of help to you. If not, we'll pick up anyway and, and fill in some of the gaps. But what we want to see this morning, imposing rules from without does nothing to develop new life within. What honors God is the work of the Holy Spirit in our life. Quick review. The false teachers in Colossae and throughout the Lycus Valley were basically saying this as a part of their message. What you're lacking, we can supply. So it, 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 their, their message was Epaphras, who had founded the churches, he certainly is doing a good job. He's doing, no doubt, the best he can. And, and the things that he has shared with you and he has taught you, wow, what a good start. But there's so much that you're missing out on in his message. And, and so they were wanting to fill in all of the supposed gaps. And, and their message was, you've gotten off to a good start, but here, let us help you go the rest of the way with the teaching that you haven't received yet. And so the battle develops on three different fronts as Paul has to take this on. Legalism is what we looked at last week. Legalism basically saying here are man-made rules and they're so good that they're, 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 well, they are just equal with God's rules. And so they elevated them to the place of having great moral uh, equivalency to, to what the Word says. And it became an external display alone, right? And then there's mysticism. And in mysticism, it's basically someone saying, this is what God told me. This is what God has revealed to me. And sometimes it's hard to know what to say back to somebody when they're telling you that this is what God told them to do. And sometimes they come with a message for what God told them to tell you to do. And obviously, if it's not in keeping with the word, uh, we need to step back and say, okay, well, what is going on here? So mysticism, all about one's experience. And then what we look at this morning, asceticism. Asceticism is basically spirituality by deprivation. Spirituality by depriving yourself of certain things. So what is Paul's answer? In, in a general way, we could say Paul's answer to these false teachers who, who are saying, you're, you're just missing out on so much. Paul comes right back and says, listen, you're lacking nothing. You're not lacking anything. You have fullness and you have freedom in Christ. And that's Paul's response to the false teachers. You're not lacking anything. God has given you everything. Once you have tasted of the beauty and the wonder and have understood the riches of God's grace, and once you have come to realize the truth of what it means to be in Christ, you have no desire to go back. And that's why Paul said in that verse that we looked at uh, by way of our scripture memory last week, it is for freedom that Christ has set you free, Galatians 5. So don't yield and give that freedom back under any circumstance because God has set you free for a purpose and a reason. So let's look this morning at uh, really Paul saying almost, let's go over this again, all right? Let's go over this again, only this time we're going to look at not legalism, not mysticism, but we're going to look at asceticism. Now, we're probably not as familiar with asceticism. I mean, we, we probably have all heard the term legalism, even if we don't always understand how it's being used. But asceticism is a close cousin, and it's very uh, apparent as we look at, first of all, the features of asceticism. So let's do that. Just very quickly and briefly, let me, let me put before you six things that is true of asceticism, and that's what Paul is dealing with here, as we're going to see when we get to the 20th verse and read that verse. But asceticism sees the physical, the body, as being primarily evil. It sees the body as evil. In fact, material things in general are, for an ascetic, uh, somewhat to be brought under suspicion. And you want to be mindful of the fact that they are probably to be avoided. Uh, there were, that, that created immediately a dualistic view of life so that you had physical things that we're going to see were to enjoy, and they then created another whole category of spiritual. And you can kind of see how if you bought into that worldview that the physical, and especially the body, is evil, well, what do you do with the fundamental truth of the incarnation of the Son of God? You know what you did with it? The docetics at the end of the first century couldn't make peace with the fact that Jesus could be God and man. 
So they affirmed his deity and they denied his humanity. And that's the catch that often happens when we take an unbiblical view that says the body is evil. Secondly, asceticism seeks to bring the body into submission to the will. Now you say, well, what's wrong with that? Don't we want to bring the body in submission to the will? Of course we do. Because Paul writes often, doesn't he, about the, uh, the value of self-discipline. We all know that if you don't have any self-discipline, you're going to be in a world of hurt in a hurry. So it's not that they want to bring the body in submission to the will that's the problem. It's how they want to do that. And an ascetic basically wants to do that by just sheer determination and willpower, which we all know isn't going to work. Thirdly, joy and pleasure are wrong. Joy and pleasure are wrong. It wasn't said of ascetics. It was wrongly said of the Puritans. But I'm going to use it for the ascetics this morning. An ascetic is someone with a haunting fear that someone somewhere may be having fun. And that was said wrongfully about Puritans. Puritans, that was not their worldview. But that's what they have been labeled with because people misunderstand them. But it is true of an ascetic. An ascetic did live with the haunting fear that somebody somewhere was enjoying and, 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 and having pleasure on some level in their life. So an ascetic didn't, didn't, go, didn't go there. Fourth, uh, by nature, it's restrictive and it's repressive. It's restrictive and it's repressive. Uh, we'll see that their motto is don't. Some of you might know an ascetic <laughs> based on that. Don't. Uh, number five, the focus is on the flesh. That is the fallenness of our, of our humanity. They're going to speak at the end of verse 18. We noted this last week where he talked about by reason of their fleshly or their sensuous mind. So they, they rightly understand that there's a problem within each one of us, but their solution to that problem is woefully lacking. And then lastly, the goal is to gain acceptance from God. See why it's a cousin of legalism? Legalism basically wants to put a whole bunch of external rules on people and say that's how you get to a point where you know for sure you're pleasing God. Well, in asceticism, it's very similar in that they're trying to, to, to claim that by means of their behavior, they are producing a spirituality. Whereas we believe the New Testament is clear that it is out of spirituality that our behavior flows. We don't prove on the basis of behavior alone how spiritual we are. So those things kind of give us a little bit of a background to what Paul's going to say as we begin in the 20th verse to look at the failures of asceticism. And let's note three of them this morning. And we begin by seeing asceticism falls short because it contradicts God's message. Now, that's enough, isn't it? If we're, if we're presented with something that we can show is a contradiction of the very message that God has given to us, then the case is closed, it's over, let's go down and have brunch. Well, uh, let's wait. Let's do a couple of other things first. It, it is totally contrary to God's message. And look what we see in verse 20 by how that is uh, reflected. If with Christ you died to the ecumenical spirits of the world, why, as if you were still alive in the world, do you submit to regulations? So, if with Christ you died. The message, we have died with Christ. Now, in the English Standard Version, we, we have the word if, but it's, it's an if that really could be translated since. The New International Version does translate it since. So, it's, it's indicating to us that this is not just a possibility. This is a reality. This, in fact, could be said to be the foundational message of Christianity, that we have died with Christ. It has everything to do with our identification with Christ. It's the basis on which the message of freedom and fullness comes to us. We have died with Christ. That's Paul's point. That's why we have this freedom and this fullness, because of what it is that has happened for us. The idea here, then, is this is a reality. This is a fact. We call this positional truth, that something happened at the point of putting your trust in Christ. And what happened? 
was that you were made a new person and you died with Christ. I think it's easy for us to look at the cross and, and to see there the reminder of the death of our Lord. And that's true. And that, that is as it should be. But we also want to have God's perspective of the cross. And God's perspective of the cross, and it should be ours as well, is to see that the cross is in fact the place where Jesus gave his life for us. But then let's not forget this. The cross is the place where we died too. All right? The cross is forever a reminder that Jesus died there for our sins. But that same cross calls out and reminds us that we died with Christ there as well. And so that's the point that Paul is making. So if that's true, and it is, then the next thing that Paul says, why not follow Jesus? Why not follow Jesus instead of all these rules that people are thinking up for you? And all of this uh, repressive depriving of yourself of any joy and pleasure. You look at that phrase again in verse 20. If with Christ, okay, since you have died with Christ to the elemental spirits of the world. Remember that phrase? We saw that back in chapter 2, verse 8. See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world. So here it is again. He repeats it again in verse 20. And it is either this idea of these most basic things, right? These elemental principles, but it can also be understood as elemental spirits. And it might very well be that Paul has in mind both of these things. And it might very well be that he is reminding us yet again that behind this philosophy of life, this misguided sense that by doing this list of things, you become spiritual. By avoiding this list of things, you become spiritual. Listen, it could very well be that Paul is indicating to us that behind that mentality, that mindset, which is driven by self-righteousness and pride, right? There is the deceiver who is at work. And the elemental spirits is easily a reminder to us that Satan and his demons are always at work trying to distract us from what is so terribly important, of what is of primary importance. What is of primary importance? That we died with Christ. Anything that he can do to, to, to take us off of that message, anything that he can put into our minds that contradicts that truth, he's going to want to do that. And so we come back and say, we have died with Christ. So we don't need to follow all of these man-made rules. We want to be followers of Jesus. Listen, the world loves religion, right? The world loves religion. The world cannot live without religion. It can't. If we understand religion to be man making every attempt possible to reach God by his own terms and in his own way, then the world loves religion and the world can't live without religion. But here is God's reminder to us that we have died with Christ. Therefore, we are followers of Jesus, not followers of man-made rules and regulations behind which is the spirit of deception to take us off of the true message. You know, even the great reformer, Martin Luther, before he came to faith in Christ, laid in his room in the monastery in Germany in the dead of winter, naked. Why? Because he was an ascetic. He felt that he was gaining some measure of blessing from God by de depriving himself even of, of clothing and, and, and the comfort of warmth. And, and church history is replete with, with all kinds of illustrations just like that. And it wasn't until he's reading Romans and he discovers that the just shall live by faith because we have, in fact, died with Christ, right? Jesus was no ascetic. Jesus loved life. He was criticized for not being an ascetic. He was criticized for enjoying life too much, right? They, they referenced him in, in very unkind ways. But he was a lover of life. 
and he enjoyed the freedom and the fullness that God had given to him and to us. So asceticism fails because it contradicts the message of God's word. Secondly, asceticism falls short because it's negative in its approach to life. It's negative in its approach to life. Look at verse 21. Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch, referring to things that, per, that perish as they are used according to human precepts and teachings. So if we have died with Christ, and if Jesus was no ascetic, then Paul would say to us, don't pay any attention to these mottos, don't handle, don't taste, don't touch. It's very likely that this was an actual motto out of the first century, that this was one of the things that the false teachers threw out there as a part of their teaching. You want to be a spiritual person? Well, then don't handle, as in grasping and holding, don't even taste, and, and, and don't even touch. So that's probably something that was drawn out of Judaism and a mix with paganism that was being suggested. So some kind of a pseudo-spirituality that if you uh, avoid and if you deprive and if you follow this external list, then somehow you're going to be spiritual before God. You know, when I think of that, don't handle, don't taste, don't touch. It's not an exact correlation, but I can't help but go back to Genesis 3 when God put Adam and Eve in the garden and, and he told them what? He told them, here, here is the garden. Everything in this garden you are to enjoy. But one thing, every tree of the, of the garden you are to, to eat of and enjoy. Just don't eat of the one tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Every other tree, every other fruit, every other blessing, take it into the full. And what happens? The serpent comes along, doesn't he? Satan comes along. And he, he says to Adam and to Eve, Adam standing right there as he talks with Eve, Eve, you know, has God really said this stuff? Because if he has, uh, I don't think he's being honest with you. I don't think he's being forthcoming with you. I, I think he's holding out on you. There, there's really something here that, that you need to be aware of and that there is more than God is telling you. And in fact, he said uh, to her, you're not even supposed to touch that, are you? Well, God never said that. So he adds to, doesn't he, what God had already prescribed. God had not said that you shall not touch. He said you shall not eat of this one tree. And Satan moves in as he does so often, and he distorts the truth, distorts the Word of God, and we need to be reminded that the motto, don't handle, uh, don't taste, don't touch, is far removed from what God does say to us, which is what? The kingdom of God is what? The kingdom of God, Romans 14, 17, is not a matter of eating and drinking. I don't care what social media, Snapchat, and all the other stuff says to us about everybody's posting of pictures of food, right? Right at the least opportune times, they, we, we come across some, somebody wanting us to see what they're eating. That's not the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is not eating and drinking. The kingdom of God is righteousness, and it is peace, and it is joy in the Holy Spirit. What a, what a different message we have than the motto, don't handle, don't taste, don't touch. No, our message is the kingdom of God is, in fact, not to be described merely in the material things of life, but there is so much more, even while we are to enjoy that, there is so much more. There is righteousness, there is joy, uh, peace, and there is joy. Listen. Wherever joyful confidence in Christ diminishes, all right? Wherever joyful confidence in Christ diminishes, you can be sure of one thing, that human regulation and human rules and human ideas are going to be fostered to fill in what can be filled in by only Christ himself. And so Jesus would have us to know that there are things that only Christ can do for us. For the kingdom of God is righteousness, 
and it is peace and it is joy. What did the psalmist say in Psalm 34, 8? Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good, right? Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. We're not called to a life of asceticism, of deprivation to become spiritual. The Christian life is not suppression. The Christian life is an expression of joy, of righteousness and peace. After all, Jesus said that he came not just to give us life, but to give us life in abundance. So the ascetic misses it by having such a negative outlook on life. And if that's where you live, then you need to repent and you need to say, God, I don't want to have that perspective of life because your perspective is so different from that. You want me to live in righteousness. You want me to live in peace. You want me to experience your joy, not just negativity. And then lastly, asceticism falls short because it's based on human authority. It falls short because it's based on human authority. Look at verse 23 at the last of this chapter. These have indeed an appearance of wisdom. What, what does? All of these rules, all of these regulations, all of this deprivation, all of this denial. He says, finally, these have indeed an appearance of wisdom in promoting self-made religion and asceticism and severity to the body, but... They are of no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. Appearances truly are deceiving, aren't they? Appearances are deceiving. I'm going to be holy by doing these things, and you're going to get to see just how holy I am because you're going to be able to look at my life and see all of the things that I'm doing or not doing, all of the things that I'm giving up, all of the things that I'm avoiding. You're going to see me in all of my spirituality. That's what legalism does. That's what mysticism ultimately does. That's what asceticism does. It provides a veneer of spirituality. But what a good word from the Holy Spirit to say to us, be careful that behind all of that outward veneer and all of that outward behavior, what is the condition of the heart? What's going on in the heart? You know what Jesus said in, in uh, Matthew 6? And, and listen to what he said in uh, verse 16. And when you fast, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces, that their fasting may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face, that your fasting may not be seen by others, but by your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. But Jesus, don't you understand that misses the point? We're doing all this stuff to be seen by others. We're doing all this stuff so other people do see how holy we are, do see how righteous we are, do see how spiritual we are. Never mind what's going on in our heart. Never mind all the mental attitude sins that we struggle with that are overwhelmed by every day. Look at our list and see what's going on by the behavior of our life and, and how we present ourselves in those right moments to others. Not behind closed doors where only my family sees me. That's what he's saying. Appearances can be so terribly deceiving when we get all of this stuff out of order and forget that the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking and external appearances it is righteousness that only the Holy Spirit can produce. It is peace that only the Holy Spirit gives us. It is joy that comes only by walking in fellowship with God. So appearances can be deceiving. And, and then with that, asceticism, in fact, only works to feed the flesh. You see, that's the tragic thing at the end of the day, is that legalism, mysticism, asceticism don't, in fact, put in check the flesh they feed the flesh in the most horrific way. Spiritual pride is the intractable sin of legalism and of mysticism and of asceticism. 
C.H. Spurgeon said, I have found in my own spiritual life that the more rules I lay down for myself, the more sins I commit. (laughs) It's kind of like the wet paint sign, right? Don't touch. We want to touch it. H.A. Ironside, who was a famous Bible teacher of generations ago, went to a friend and told his friend that he was struggling with pride, that his, his main sin that he was dealing with was the sin of pride. And his friend said, well, here's what you need to do. You need to, uh, to put on a signboard. Those of you that are older will know what a signboard is. I don't know if we ever see him today, but you would literally wear a signboard on the front and the back, and they would write advertisements, and people would walk around with a signboard and advertise something. And his friend said, you need to put on a signboard and you need to write verses about pride on the signboard. And then since he lived in Chicago, he said, you need to go to downtown Chicago and you need to walk up and down the streets of downtown Chicago and you need to call out as loud as you can these scripture verses about pride. And he did it. Ironside said he went and he spent the day walking downtown Chicago with the signboard on describing what the Bible says about pride. And then when he got home that night, as he took off the signboard, he thought to himself, there's not another man in Chicago that would have done that all day. And that's what the flesh feeds off, doesn't it? The flesh feeds off of asceticism. The flesh feeds off of legalism. It's the intractable sin that will not yield to deprivation, that will not yield to the rules of men. Why not? Because imposing rules from without does nothing to develop new life within. That only happens as we walk by the power of God's Spirit. So what do we take away? What do we take away? The pressing question of the hour that I think is really being asked in this set of verses is, in fact, what is the way to victory? What is it that I can do to live a holy life? How how can I do this? How can I overcome the power of the flesh? That's what Paul's grappling with ultimately. The answer is going to come more fully in chapter 3, verse 1. But rather than just saying, come back and we'll see at some point in the future, let's answer it in part. Because the truth is you can't win the battle against indwelling sin by mere avoidance. It does not work. It requires something very drastic from us. And that drastic measure is it, in fact, requires death. It requires death. And that death is I have to die daily to self and to live in dependence on God. And you see, that's what he said at that 20th verse. He acknowledges the fact that I have died with Christ. What I forget very regularly is that I have died with Christ. And so I have to come back every day, repeatedly throughout the day, to remind myself that Carlin died with Christ. That this principle of indwelling sin no longer holds dominion over me because I have died with Christ and I have to be willing to regularly be reminded of that. I love what Rosaria Butterfield has written, and you know I have mentioned her on more than one occasion. This is the way she puts it. You are called to drive a fresh nail into your indwelling sin pattern every day. You are called to drive a fresh nail into your indwelling sin pattern every day. That, my friends, is what the gospel calls us to. It calls us to this drastic solution of of recognizing that we have died, in fact, with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ lives within me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So this morning, how is it that we live Well, we live through the life of Christ, don't we? Christ living in me, the hope of glory. If you're here this morning and you've never put your trust in Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, He's our personal Savior. 
He is the one who has entered into this most horrific experience of dying on that cross, not just to give us an example of what a good man would do for his friends, but he died there as a substitute in my place and in yours. And if you will put your trust and your faith in Christ alone and in what he did, God tells us this glorious truth that in this transaction of grace, he gives to us the forgiveness of sins and eternal life. And it is simply required of us that we agree with what God has said, that we trust and believe that what Jesus did is enough. Let's pray. Father God, thank you again for the truth of your word that shows us the solution to our great need. And Lord, that need is one that we face daily, and it is one that we want to claim every day, and it is one that we want to acknowledge that apart from you, we can do nothing, but in Christ, we can do all things. So we ask your blessing on your word. We ask your blessing on the rest of this morning, Father, and on our time together in fellowship around this meal for the food that you've provided and for those who have prepared it. We're grateful. Bless this fellowship of your people and uh, cause us to rejoice in your goodness and grace. In Jesus' name, amen.